Let's share in God's good work together from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Throughout our series, we've been lifting up Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a metaphor of resilience and an example, a great example of resilience. But it's only right to say that it cost him his life. Over my shoulder is room 306, where Dr. King was assassinated. And before his death, he wrote these words. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. If you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice, say that I was a drum major for peace, I was a drum major for righteousness. I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. So as we close this series on resilience, yes, we want you to be resilient. But it's also true and right to say that God calls each of us to leave a life committed to him, to service, for justice, for goodness in this world. On April 3rd, 1968, Dr. King returned to Memphis to work alongside the striking sanitation workers. And when he arrived at the Lorraine Motel, Aides briefed him on the plans for the upcoming march. And that evening, Dr. King spoke eloquently and passionately. And at that rally, he gave his last speech. And this is what he said, prophetically. We have some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I have been to the mountaintop, he said. I've seen the promised land. Then he said these words, I may not get there with you. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Amen? Amen. Together. Less than 24 hours after these prophetic words, Dr. King was assassinated. This thing that is to be a United Methodist, to be a Christian, to live our life not for ourselves but for others, for the world, to have heaven come to earth, to make disciples for the very transformation of the world is more than talk. In our ritual for each and every funeral that we do here, we have this striking line in the book of worship. This is the prayer. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. That's our prayer. To live ready to die and to die that we might go on to live. So we close this series today, this Father's Day, on resilience, finding strength in the chaos. And it has been chaos, at least last night in the storms. There's been some chaos. And so we won't recap the whole thing, but I do want to share a few things that we've learned thus far about resilience. And the first thing is that we don't just gather to gather. We gather because we want to be ready for God to use us to transform resistance, which is always there, and despair into hope, into hope. But to be ready, it takes a clear identity. There was a day when to be Methodist was to have an identity, that you would do no harm, that you would do good that you would uh, attend on the things of God. 
So it takes an identity to ground us and a strong resistance then to grow us. It takes both. And Dr. King, in, in one of his speeches, said, With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope, the cornerstone of Jesus. And so we ask God not to just make us strong, not to make us win, but to make us flexible and strong. For us to become tempered. Dr. Bolsinger in his book says it like this. Resilience is not about becoming smarter or tougher. It's about becoming stronger and more flexible. It's about becoming tempered. Like tempered glass or tempered steel. And so it takes not just hardship. There's no sense in having hardship for hardship. It's hardship plus relationship. And community. That's what we see in Dr. King. And the nonviolence movement. And it is that hardship plus community together. That forms strength and resilience. And so around here we know that we never do ministry alone. That, that, that's dangerous stuff. Never alone. Always at least ministry in twos or more. And again, Dr. Bolsinger would say to lead alone. Well, friends, that's reckless. It's arrogant. It's foolish. It's dangerous to both self and others. So we need all kinds of people in our lives, don't we? We need teammates and partners and co-workers to share that responsibility and the struggle with. And so we call those front stage people around here. But we also need supervisors and mentors and coaches to help us see and grow those things that we can't see ourselves. That's supervision, things you can't see on your own. And we need friends and family members. Do they... They care about how your day went at work, but not because of the work you did, because of who you are. Do you have anybody in your life like that? They just love you because they love you because they love you? We need those folks too. And if we want to be resilient in moments of stress, then we have to train ahead of time. It doesn't just happen. This has been attributed to a number of people and said in different ways, uh, but it basically boils down to this. At the moment of crisis, friends, you don't rise to the occasion. You default to your training. And that was really the brilliance of Dr. King's movement. They trained and trained and trained for those moments of stress. And the world saw people who showed love in the face of hate, who stood firm in the chaos. And so as we look at our lives in faith moving forward as no longer a majority culture, but now in a minority culture as Christians, less than 50% of the population in America, for the first time it's happened, so we need to be ruthlessly realistic about what we can do. We need to create a rule of life. Maybe it's something as simple as kneeling three times a day, morning, noon, and night, that helps us to train to follow Jesus resiliently. One of the things that's been really helpful to me is when Pastor Brandon taught me Bible before phone. Just that simple. Bible before phone. And as I've done that, it really makes a difference. I'd much rather uh, wake up to the Word of God that tells me who I am than my email who tells me somebody else that I better get going. Right? Bible before phone, just that easy. So this week, friends, we are called to be ruthlessly realistic as well about the cost. You have to count the cost. If you haven't read the book, um, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I recommend it to you. It's a powerful book. Jesus would talk to his followers over and over and over again about what discipleship costs that we are to live differently than the world not just like the world not do what you do with a little jesus on it but for you to be really transformed for you to live differently see jesus says to all of us who would listen say it with me love your enemies what i mean this this isn't a suggestion this is what it is to be a follower of jesus of any denomination love your enemies do good to those who hate you Really, bless those who curse you. This is Jesus talking, friends. This is non-negotiable stuff. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, your outer garment, do not withhold even your shirt. Because that would happen in Jesus' day. Someone would grab your outer garment as you go on and you would try to get out of there to be safe. And Jesus says, no, no, no. If they're that desperate, they probably need your shirt too. It'll change the dynamic and what's going on. He goes on even further. He says, actually give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Or as my mama taught me, if you're not willing to lose it, don't lend it. Right? And any of you all who have ever lent something to someone and never gotten it back, how's that relationship going? Not well. Not well. Never lend something you're not willing to lose. And so Jesus says, well, let's just go on past that. If anybody takes it, don't lose your life chasing it. Just go on. 
Go on. I can't tell you how many people I've seen in ministry over the last 20 to 30 years that have lost decades of their life chasing something that had been taken from them. Just miserable folk trying to get something that they can never get back. So, when we talk about Dr. King, and we do lift him up uh, as one of the great martyrs of our faith, there have been many that go on before him, and there will be those that come after. One of the more famous uh, missionaries uh, is Jim Elliott, and uh, if you've been around here a long time, you've heard me uh, use this quote before. Jim says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And that's exactly what happened with Jim Elliott. He wrote these words on October 28, 1949. He felt called to go to the Warani tribe in Ecuador, and they killed him. They did not want to be found by the outside world. And today, there are numbers of the Warani tribe that actually know Jesus, follow Jesus today. There are also others that still don't want to be bothered, don't want to be uh, people coming in from them from the outside world. So, we know these things. These things from Jesus are clear, but what's, what's the problem? Why doesn't it happen? Well, because what we want, if we're honest, is a pain-free solution. We're not opposed to a solution. We'd love one, but we want one that doesn't cost us anything. We want an ease of life, and we certainly want certainty, don't we? Just tell me the answer. Is it, is it black or is it white? Somebody, somebody just tell me. What am I supposed to do? And security. You know, the older you get, the more you have to lose in terms of stuff. You know, that's one of the reasons that the, the great revolutions of the world happen with kids in their 20s. They have no idea what they're about to lose, right? We want a pain-free solution, which does not exist. So what we want are these things, but what we need is meaningful work. That's what we need. That's when we're happiest, when we have a community and we have faith that God will take care of us in the ambiguity, not in the certainty. The only thing we're certain of is that God will take care of us. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know with whom. And that's not, that's, that's not all bad news because Dr. King would say, friends, when it comes to faith, faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. It's the first step. And my experience with the Lord is he never shows me the whole staircase. I certainly didn't see this when I was 31. Not at all. I saw an empty field out here that we could afford. That was about it. Right? Faith is taking that first step. The other challenge about the transformation of the world is that we're all for it if somebody else will do it. We want other people to change. You ever been in an argument? You want that other person to come around and have some sense. We want other people to change. For them to do it. And then if they do it, then maybe we'll consider it. But here's the problem with that. It doesn't work. Why? Well, in the wisdom of Rabbi Sachs, he says, so long as there's conflict within us, there will be conflict around us. And we have to resolve the tension in ourselves before we can do so for others. Now, if you take just a moment in your own life or in others' life, you'll see this. And of course, it's easier to see in other people's lives. You see somebody and there's conflict spinning around them. You see them at the high school reunion 10 years later, still conflict surrounding them. Right? There's some people that trouble just seems to be there. They're always having a hard day. Don't you know those folks where you're like, you're about to say, oh, how are you doing? And you're like, oh, I better not ask that because the last 30 times they've said, I'm terrible. Everybody hates me. It's all a problem. Well, yeah, because if you've got conflict within you that's unaddressed, there'll be conflict around you. That's how it works. So when it comes to Moving forward in the faith, our calling, it can't be born out of a desire to lead about look at me, look at me. No, but out of a service to others in light of the brutal facts of the world. We're not Pollyanna about this. We're not naive about this. Yes, there are very difficult things in the world, very difficult things that you're dealing with right now in your family, in your life. But your calling comes out of that. God wants to redeem your pain, to use it. And, and most times, when, what I see in ministry is that wherever your pain has been, that's where your ministry starts. Because you can empathize, you can come alongside people in ways that other people cannot, because you've been there, you know what it is. This is the first Father's Day in my life where I actually know what it is to have Father's Day when you've lost your dad. I never knew how to do that before today. This is my first time. 
Some of you have been doing that for years and years. But until today, I didn't, I didn't know what that felt like. Many of you do. Have for a long time. You see, even though it's scary, even though it's hard, Dr. King would say that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. They really matter. There are things in your life that matter a lot. And we need to step into that because that's where heaven is, where what God wants done is done. But it does take sacrifice. It does take loss. And we don't know if we can handle that. And, and the answer is we can't without each other. We can't without the Lord. We can't without the leading of the Holy Spirit. It takes all of that together. So we ask the question, how do we survive the losses that are necessary to bring about that transformation? Because we, we're not sure we can even survive it. And Jesus shows us the answer. And yes, it is actually the Sunday school answer. And that is, love others. And not just others, everyone. Love everyone, Jesus says, and show it. Don't just think it, just don't pray about it. But actually do it. Show it by doing to others as you would have them do to you. That's how people know it's real. right? They may not believe what you say, they will believe what you do. So Jesus says it like this. If you want to live in the kingdom... If you want to show the power that resides within you through the power of the Holy Spirit, do to others as you'd have them do to you. The golden rule. And then he goes on to say, by the way, I'm not unaware of the way the world works. He says, if you love those who love you, so what? Right? That's what he's saying. What credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. That's not hard. If you do good to those who do good to you, again, so what? What credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And it's just good business. Right? If, if, if something's going well, treat other people well, and it'll go well for you. He, he goes further. He says, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Again, just good business. Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But, Jesus says, say it with me, love your enemies. I know some of you are like, I'm not saying that. It's hard. Do good and lend, and again, say with me, expecting nothing in return. By the way, that's the best way to live, because if you do get something, then you're like, bonus. My family was always like, keep your expectations low so you can leap over them. <laughs> Expect nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for He is kind. God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. When's the last time you heard that preached? Hey, don't worry about it. God's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. You ungrateful and wicked people. He's kind to you. God sends the wind and the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And then Jesus says, be merciful. Just as your father is merciful. You see, friends, transformation, it flows not from a desire to achieve, not to look good, not to succeed, not to accomplish, but to serve at the point of a real need. That's where ministry is born of. When you can actually address something that's going on in your world. And by the way, shout out to all the teachers in the room. Because if you're following the news at all, you know there's a lot of work to be done for our young people in Oklahoma. If you haven't uh, read the study this week, we are about dead last. I mean, thank God for Mississippi. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm an Oklahoma kid. But that's the way it's been. I mean, we are about dead last in category after category. It's embarrassing and not necessary. It's not a have to. Right? So Dr. King, again, he would ask it like this. He says, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? That's, that's the question if you're a follower of Jesus. But we, we step back from that. Why? Because change takes longer than we like and includes working with others that we don't like. I said always like, but the truth is we just don't like them. There's some people you just don't like. But you're not going to move the needle forward anywhere if you only work with people that think like you and that you like, that it's easy. Nothing ever happens like that. That's a country club. You just stay in your club. If you want transformation in the world, you have to keep at it. And by the way, it'll outlast your life. And you have to work with people that you don't agree with even. You say, what we're doing is more important than how I'm feeling. What God is calling us to is more important than our differences. Thank you for the amen. That should have gotten one, right? That's who we are. That's who we are. People who do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because others are doing it. And Luke 6, again, Jesus would say, don't judge then. If this is going to happen, then we can't judge. 
Don't judge and you won't be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. And then Jesus just tells you something that's axiomatic. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. You know, one of my favorite terrible preacher jokes is uh, the guy that came to me uh, and, he, and uh, last Christmas, he said, and this, this only works if you're an old-time school uh, church person, so forgive me if you're new to the faith. He says, I'm not coming back to your church, Pastor Mark. And I said, why not? He said, because you always sing the same songs. I'm like, we do? He says, yes, every time I come to the church, it's either away in a manger or up from the grave he arose. Every time. <laughs> It's a hymnal joke. I'm sorry for the, those who don't get that. It's a little funny. So Jesus says to his followers in Luke 6, right? This is, this is what he says. It is not enough to love God. That's really what he's saying. It's not. There's another part to it. Scott McKnight says it like this. It's not enough to even know God personally and to have faith and confidence in God's love for you. That's good, but it's not enough takes action. It's not enough to be spiritual. It's not enough to be religious. It's not enough to go to church or to live for a higher power. It takes action. It's also not enough to have a good church, which we do. It's not enough to have a healthy church, which we do. It's not enough to have a growing church, which we do, thank God. Those things are good, all of them, but they are not enough. The photos you're seeing are of our students here doing good work in Memphis. You see, Scott McKnight would write, and he's right, in his book, The Jesus Creed, he says, the end or goal of life for Jesus, whether for an individual or a community, is to love God and, say it with me, love others. And they are equal in importance, friends. Really, they're equal in importance. You don't get to do one without the other, right? Love of God and not love of others doesn't work. And by the way, the opposite is true. Love of others without any love of God, that doesn't work either. You cannot have one without the other. You must, must, must have both love of God and love of others together. A number of years ago, Chantel uh, went to a training from the Lombard Peace Institute, um, and she came back with this knowledge, which is, which is incredible. That's from the Mennonites. They simply say it like this. When you come into conflict, when the world needs some peace, this is how you do it. You stay calm, you stay connected, and you stay the course. That's what you do. Stay calm, which sometimes we can do. Stay connected is harder, particularly if you don't like the people in the room. And then stay the course. And by the way, if any of you are wondering about our church, that's what we do. We stay the course. I don't care what any other church in the world is doing. And you need to hear that. I need to know whether the Holy Spirit is guiding our church and whether God is pleased at this place. That's all I care about. That's it. Are we doing what God calls us to do, yes or no? And if the, if the word is yes, then we'll just keep doing it. If the word is no, then my supervisor will tell me, of which I have many. But this, friends, this work takes more than we have. It really does. So, so here's, here's the truth about this movement that's hard. And that is that when you work too hard and you rest too little, you get hurt. There's more ministry that we can do every day than we can ever do. That's one of the hard things about being on church staff. You just finally figure it out. You're like, I didn't get to this today. Like, nope, you're not going to. You have to ask the Lord what's most important today. And you may say, well, why do we go all the way to Memphis to do this work? Well, because um, if you go to the Civil Rights Museum, they have this, this little piece right here that lets you know a demographic study. And they say, this is what Memphis looks like. African Americans in blue, white folks in red, and the map looks like this not together, right? right? Right along here. One set of people, the other set of people. Still, today. Uh, and I, I invite you to look at Oklahoma City. It doesn't look like that, but certainly when it comes to Hispanic folk, there, there's a certain area where almost all the Hispanic folk live south of the river. Right? And then you've got all the, not all, but a lot of the African-American folk over around Millwood and white folks other places. Our maps aren't that different. Rick Warren says, though, when it comes to this work, 
servants, you and I, we think about the work, not what others are doing. Right? We, we want to have the blinders on, on on either side. We want to keep at the work. It doesn't matter what that church is doing or that group is doing. We want to do the work that God's calling us to do. And the important good work that God has for us to do will take more than one lifetime to do. Which is why I love um, getting to see photos of like the Sagrada Familia in Spain. Because that took generation after generation after generation. That's still a work in progress. You look at all the cathedrals in Europe. Everybody that worked on them knew that it would not be finished in their lifetime. They did it anyway, because God was doing something bigger than they were. I believe God still does that kind of work. I referenced Dietrich Bonhoeffer earlier in the sermon. He says this, the disciples then, you and I, must not only think of heaven, they have an earthly task as well. It is to be noted that Jesus calls not himself, but his disciples the salt of the earth, for he entrusts his work on earth to them. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Go. Do. Bring heaven to earth. So I want you to know that we're serious about that, about doing things beyond ourselves. And so while I want to lift up these students, it was right and good to do, they're just the last iteration of a long line of folks that have been working there. Right? We started back in 2015. Uh, and we, we missed 21 because they didn't do anything in 20. They didn't do anything in 20. In 21, it's not up there, even though we paid for some homes to be done by the staff because they weren't yet open back from COVID. But friends, we've taken seven groups in nine years with more than $62,000 invested in Memphis, just from our little church. And SOS as an organization over that time since 1986 has helped more than 1,000 families, more than 1,000 homes, making a difference. And so I, there's, there's no way for me to express the good work that they do, so I want you to hear it from somebody who's been at it um, much of her life. Uh, this young woman I met last week, her name is Dorothy Smith. She's adorable. Um, well, I'm from here in Memphis, and I know how much this um, benefits the community. I love being able to like walk down the streets and be like, I know that homeowner, I've worked on that house. Um, and also I think it just shows a different side of the community that's definitely um, kind of seen over a lot, especially here in Memphis. It has a real strong stereotype of being dangerous and dirty and the people being bad. But I think like from what y'all have seen so far, like it's not like that, uh, or I mean, some parts are like that, but there's a lot of pride in this community. Um, People love SOS, they know SOS, and it really does impact Memphis so significantly. Um, and also I think it's a great way not to just spread the gospel, but to show the gospel through our work. That's what we've been talking about a lot in our chapel, is modeling Jesus, not just through our belief, but through our actions, which I think is a really hard thing to do, but doing manual labor like this is definitely a great start. Um, and also, I meet great people. <laughs> All right. Way to go, team. Uh, my apologies, Will. I couldn't get back far enough to get you in the frame till the very end. But uh, very nice. Yeah. And Kendall, we saw you over there, too. So good, 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 good. So, so friends, uh, this is the work that we do that aren't, isn't on Sundays. And I'm about to share with you um, part of what makes that possible. Um, these are basically the Ten Commandments of the Nonviolence Movement. Uh, Pastor Brandon's referenced them earlier. Uh, but I want you to know that Chantel and I have committed ourselves to these values. That's how we lead. And, and quite frankly, for me, that's my expectation of you, if you call yourself a member here, because it is what it is to follow Jesus. And we talk about these things, but we haven't put them all together. Um, so I'm just going to take these straight from the Nonviolence Movement and recommend them to you. Number one, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. If you want to stand firm, that's how you do it. You know who our master is, and you follow him. Secondly, we remember always that we seek justice and reconciliation, not victory. And that's a game changer, friends. We want to be better, never better than. We're not looking to beat people. We're looking to be connected to people and bring the kingdom. That's also an amen, but it's harder. Thirdly, we want to walk and talk in the manner of love, because God is love. God is love. And we want to pray every day, every day, to be used by God in order that all people might be free, not just some. 
that all people might have access to the things they need in their life, not just some. And that's going to make us, it's going to require sacrifice. Sacrifice of what we might want to do with our personal time or our personal resources, right? Sacrifice personal wishes in order that all people might be free, that all people experience justice, not just some. Now, I don't know that you would consider this a sacrifice, but my hunch is most of our students don't eat uh, sandwiches underneath some shingles, right? But they did last week because that was what was required of them to do the work they had to do. Number six, observe with both friend and foe ordinary rules of courtesy. It doesn't matter who's on the other side, you still say thank you. It doesn't matter who's on the other side, you still say please. It doesn't matter who's walking in the door, you still hold the door. Just common courtesy, just good manners, friends. If nothing else is said about Acts 2, at least somebody ought to be able to say, those people go to Acts 2, they got good manners. We well, start there. Number seven, seek to perform regular service for others and for the world. Not just sometimes, not just when we feel like it, but regularly, regularly. And, and that, that takes work. And then, uh, maybe the one we need most these days, refrain from the violence of fist, tongue, or heart. I know what many of you are thinking, like, I haven't hit anybody in a long time. That's not what I'm worried about. I see way too many Christians with seriously violent content of tongue and heart. I mean, it's embarrassing. People just super violent with what they say about others or what they hold in their heart about others because they're competing. They're not trying to reconcile. And number nine, strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health, both, right? Because if you're going to get on a roof, you better be pretty fit. You got, you got to do that. You got, it takes both to do the work. And finally, this is the, the one that I uh, changed for us because we don't have a team leader in the way that they did. Um, but around here, we say that the Holy Spirit's in charge, right? It's not your team leader. It's, it's the Holy Spirit. And so with the Holy Spirit in charge... Uh, we want you to, to follow that as confirmed by Scripture, of course, wise counsel, and the church body. And, and by the church body, I mean the church body, not just me or not just the council, but really um, the body, that you would know how God's leading. And it really is that simple and that difficult. And we invite you to start that journey with us if you're not already there. And together, heaven will come to earth for what God wants done to be done. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.